All right, well, we should probably get started this afternoon. I know that some um, people are still Zooming on, uh, but let me welcome everyone everybody uh, to today's event. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Eric Langenbacher, a senior fellow and the director of the Society, Culture and Politics program here at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies in Washington, DC. And I'm really pleased to welcome you to this, our sixth webinar in our election year series. We've looked at all the parties and last but not least, we're gonna be looking at the FTP today. Uh, before I introduce today's speakers, um, I would like to thank all of our sponsors and collaborators, the International Association for the Study of German Politics, the Aston Center for Europe, the BMW Center for German and European Studies at Georgetown University, as well as the Foreign Office of the Federal Public of Germany uh, through the German Embassy and the German Information Center for um, helping to finance this particular series. So today we're gonna be talking about the Free Democratic Party um, and the title is Queenmaker Once More. That was my attempt to be a little witty. Uh, the FTP had the reputation for many years as being the kingmaker of German politics, but we could very well have a queen, so to say. Um, in fact, that might be the FTP's best chance back into power. Um, our two speakers, I'm so thrilled to um, briefly introduce. Uh, so first we're gonna have Sven Hilgers. He's a member of the FTP's Federal Committee on International Politics and the chairman of the FTP Berlin's community, Committee on international and European politics. Uh, he's a board member of the um, FTP Berlin. Um, he's also the manager of globalization, free trade and the market economy at the Global Themes Unit of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. And I might add an aspiring academic. Uh, he's already well published in um, a variety of journals and is working towards his PhD at the Freie Universität in Berlin. And then we will also have Ria Schröder, uh, who's a politician in the FTP. Uh, she is a former chair of the Young Liberals and a current member of the Federal Executive Committee. In fact, I heard just reelected yesterday, so congratulations to that. Uh, she lives and works as a lawyer in Hamburg, where she's also the deputy chairperson and running for the Bundestag in September. So um, before I hand the floor over, I thought it would be um, a good idea to kind of um, talk a little bit about some basics, about the party, where it's at, and um, everything. So I hope everybody can see my screen. All right, so um, obviously we that are interested in German politics look at the so-called Sonntagsfrage. You know, if there was uh, a Bundestag election next Sunday, who would you vote for? And you can see that the most recent um, polls have the FTP at 11%. There's another poll that had it as high as 12%. I think that just came out yesterday or the day before. And this is certainly an improvement over um, recent years. Um, at one point, um, I'm, I'm sad, or um, I guess I'm just reporting, the FTP was hovering around 5% uh, back in um, parts of uh, uh, 2020. Um, but especially this year, it's gone up and up and up to between 10 and 12% in the polls. If we look back at uh, the party's results, in the various Bundestag elections. Its high watermark was in 2009 under Guido Westerwelle at almost 15% of the vote. Um, there was um, an unfortunate near miss in 2013, which I guess we will talk about later on. But of course, in 2017, the party came roaring back at nearly 11% of the vote. Um, if we look a little bit more fine grained, you can see that, you know, frankly, the uh, results are, are, are kind of all over the place. Um, a more recent um, good result for the party was in Baden-Württemberg at 10.5%, 5.5 in Rheinland-Pfalz. Unfortunately, Hamburg wasn't so great back in February of 2020. And now, of course, nationally, uh, the party's polling, like I said, um, around its level that it had maybe a little bit more in the last Bundestag election. Uh, the party also just had its um, annual uh, Parteitag um, over the weekend. So I guess there's a new campaign slogan, slogan that you know there's never been more to do than now. I looked at the um, program and here are some highlights that I found. Uh, so no tax increases. In fact, there's a call for tax cuts. Uh, one of the uh, things was to reduce the corporate tax rate to 25%. Um, there's also uh, the um, desire to go back to no new debt. There's a heavy emphasis on digitalization which was also something I recall from the 2017 election. Uh, but this time, 
the emphasis has been that the pandemic has really revealed the dire need to digitalize all aspects of German life. There's an emphasis on strengthening education and research, a call for less bureaucracy and fewer regulations. Um, and then I thought it was really interesting to look at some of the clima, uh, climate um, uh, politics and policies. Uh, they want less state to achieve climate goals. Rather, they want to un un unleash the Erfindergeist, right? The spirit of innovation. Uh, they also pointed out that they do not want any speed limits on autobahns, and they don't want to ban on the internal combustion engine. And then Christian Lindner, the you know, recently reelected party leader, has also introduced something called a climate dividend, which maybe we can hear more about later on. There's a call for liberal feminism. And then also they're getting into the debate about the, um, the fees for public uh, media, and they're calling for reduction in rates for that. So to just, um, I guess, conclude, the party's been um, up in the polls as of late. Uh, they were down before. We'll see if uh, the party can maintain its momentum going into the September election, especially now that it seems that the country is doing a better job in vaccinating people, which might lead to more support for the CDU. Um, but without further ado, I would like to hand the floor over first to Sven and then Ria. Sven, I think you're muted. Yep. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having us. Um, yeah, we're delighted uh, uh, to talk about what we have done uh, the, this past weekend. Um, as you mentioned, we have the, uh, the National Convention of the FDP, the Partei Tag, um, from Friday uh, to Sunday, and, and we discuss uh, our election platform for the upcoming election. Um, and we are, that is, uh, Ria Schroeder and I will Give you a little input uh, on on where we are coming from and, and what we expect uh, um, uh, to happen in, in the upcoming year. And yeah, um, I'm a bit horrified that the presentation doesn't work. <laughs> um, I will try this one. I'm so sorry about that. So this looks better. Um, so um, again, um, we'll talk a little bit on, 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 uh, about where we are coming from, um, about what happened um, uh, in the last four years uh, when the, the Bundestag make it back to the Bundestag, to the Bundestag, and then what we expect from the super election year. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, I mean, most of you are probably familiar with, with uh, what happened uh, uh, between uh, 2013 and 2017. So the FDP uh, entered the uh, uh, coalition with the CDU and the C CSU under Chancellor Merkel uh, following a historic election success um, in 2009. Uh, and uh, there was uh, the coalition didn't went so well for us. So um, for the first time in post-war German history, um, we didn't uh, manage to, to clear the 5% hurdle for the Bundestag in 2000. Uh, 13. So um, for the first time in, in German history, uh, and actually uh, um, not only in post-war German history, but um, also uh, during the, the, the two democratic republics we had before, um, there was no liberal party uh, in the Bundestag. Uh, and so we had the, uh, the, 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 the did face the challenge uh, to renew the party um, uh, so that we uh, would again uh, make it into the Bundestag. So we designed a new mission statement. Uh, we thought about what is important. Why why are we actually in a liberal party and, and, and what we can offer uh, to the public? Um, we got a new CI. Um, uh, before that, we were just the FDP, uh, the liberals, uh, and then we became the free Democrats. Um, and we also um, decided to put, put new priorities in, in, our, in our party platform that was particularly digitalization. And, and Eric already mentioned that particularly the pandemic has revealed the importance um, of the digitalization and has um, uh, uncovered um, what happens when a party uh, is lagging behind in uh, digitalization. And then actually in, in 2017, uh, we, we turned to the Bundestag with 10.7%, making us the first largest party in the Bundestag. Um, uh, and, and now we were basically back 
in national politics, uh, uh, the first comeback of a, uh, of a party uh, in German history. Uh, um, yeah, and what followed was, um, we call it a bumpy road and, 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 and Ria will, will uh, dive more into that. Thank you so much, uh, Sven. Yeah, um, I, I will talk a little bit about the, the last four years uh, that have not been easy all the time, um, uh, especially the, the first part of it um, was uh, kind of hard. Um, so um, I, I have been a member of uh, FTP National Board since 2018, so I can tell you a little bit um, how we got where we are now, which is in good shape. Um, but it was hard work to get there. But let's start in 2017. Um, so the uh, legislation period started with a long term of exploratory negotiations, uh, which was um, yeah, more or less pre-coalition uh, negotiations um, um, between the CDU, um, the uh, FDP and the Greens. Um, and uh, after several <laughs> nerve wracking weeks, uh, they ended um, with a popular sentence by the FDP party leader Christian Lindner, which said it is better um, not to govern than to govern like in the wrong way or in a bad way. And um, uh, with this sentence, he ended um, the negotiations and um, pulled off. And what he meant was that uh, the FDP did not um, uh, found a common base for a coalition and uh, there was no trust between um, the parties um, uh, and uh, there was uh, there were no um, possibilities on the policy level to form a coalition. However, um, the um, uh, especially the the CDU was very convinced that the FTP would be easy to buy into a coalition. Um, but um, since uh, the FTP and the team, as they had been in a um, CDU FTP coalition before, they fell so badly. Um, they were not easy to buy, they demanded certain policy promises and um, that was the reason why they stepped out because they didn't get that. However, the, um, especially the, uh, in, uh, in public, um, the communication about the pullout was uh, disastrous and especially the CDU and the Greens, they blamed the FTP um, for um, the coalition not to happen and many voters were very unsatisfied um, because they voted for the FTP to govern and they were very disappointed and um, headed off to other parties and there was uh, yeah the start of very hard times where the FTP had to um, yeah build trust again from from the beginning and uh, it was the start for another grand coalition between SPD and CDU um, which uh, no one in Germany wanted, uh, not even the SPD um, or the CDU. Um, so uh, still today, when FDP pol politicians criticize the grand coalition um, policies, many people are referring to this uh, yeah, uh, unsuccessful coalition forming in 2017 and say, oh, you didn't want to govern, so um, now be quiet. Um, we don't want to hear from you. Um, and um, however, um, opposition is a hard time and it's um, it, it's always a bad position um, if you can't um, do something, but you only uh, can say what you don't like about it. And we come to that in the um, COVID-19 pandemic later on. Um, and uh, so there was a very hard start uh, for this legislation. But also, um, I think we have in, our, um, uh, in, in the Bundestag many new young people um, that are in, uh, in the Bundestag for the first time and they did very good work. So we also see um, high times when, um, when they were um, doing a very good work and were hard working for um, the FDP in the Bundestag. So um, then after like more or less uh, two, two and a half years ups and downs, um, in uh, 2020, the FDP faced very difficult times in the state elections in Thuringia, which is a 2 million people state in Eastern Germany. The FDP got 5% of the votes, uh, as Eric already mentioned. Um, however, the, in uh, February, when the state parliament elected their minister president, uh, it was a scandal when Thomas Kemmerich, who was the lead candidate of FDP, 
um, was initially elected as um, minister president uh, with the support of the far right AFD. Um, so uh, they had their own candidate, but they didn't vote for him. They voted for Thomas Kemmerich, uh, who you can see on the on the left of the photo, and on the right is the um, party leader in Thuringia of the far right AFD. And still, this photo it hurts me so much because um, it was um, yeah a very um, embarrassing situation for a liberal party, for a progressive liberal party in the tradition of humanism. Um, to um, yeah, um, be in cooperation, uh, however, uh, with the nationalist, uh, nationalist far right party, um, from my opinion, and uh, for many others in, in the FDP, it must be crystal clear that there is no way of cooperation with the AFD. And um, so that's also the reason why um, the national board took action and um, uh, Kemmerich uh, quickly resigned. Um, but um, however, that incident uh, yeah, was a national scandal for the party. And it also um, was, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, many people lost their trust in, um, in the FDP. And we also lost the state elections in Hamburg, um, as Eric already mentioned, um, which is especially sad because the Hamburg elections in 2015, when the FDP was not in the national parliament, was like, the, the icebreaker election, because it was the first time um, the FDP um, were successful again. And um, uh, yeah, thanks to um, the incidents in Thuringia, it did not uh, work out this time. So very uh, difficult sit situation for the party itself, but especially in, in the public. Um, so, and then uh, <laughs> very uh, soon after that, uh, the uh, corona pand pandemic hit Germany um, and um, the um, FDP decided to, um, on the one hand, um, not um, uh, yeah, like acknowledging that um, uh, COVID-19 is a dangerous disease and that the pandemic um, is a danger um, to health and uh, economy and education. But on the other hand, um, they were very strong in criticizing the government when they were overreaching, especially when it comes to individual rights, um, but also when it comes to economic um, issues, when it comes to schools being closed, um, and um, when there were mistakes, mismanagement by the government. Um, so that um, situation, that decision, um, uh, led to the FDP gaining a lot of support from um, many people in Germany um, and uh, yeah, uh, better results in the polls um, because yeah, many people are dissatisfied with their situation. Um, and, um, but what I found important is that the FDP is not only criticizing, but they are always um, making own proposals. For example, a step-by-step -step plan to um, get the economy um, back in charge. So, um, and, and of course there are uh, like real mistakes, mismanagements, for example, in the vaccination, um, when it come, uh, came to the economic aids that the government um, had uh, when it came to schools. So, um, and also to many missed opportunities in the past when it comes to digitization, especially in the health administration system. So that um, was a situation that helped um, the FTP to get in a very good situation now um, where we have only a few months left um, until the next elections. Yeah, thanks, Ria. Uh, if you have figured by now, we give you a bit of clarity. Uh, um, so we are now talking about the super election year. Uh, this year, we already had um, uh, two elections this year, the one in, in Baden-Württemberg, as, as Eric mentioned, um, and we have upcoming elections in uh, Saxony-Anhalt, uh, and in, in Berlin, my home state, uh, and in Thuringia, in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, and then we have the federal election. Um, so it's really a super election year. Um, and I've, we have included here a bit the polls um, where we're headed in, in, in these countries. Uh, I have to mention the one from, from Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, it's from January. So um, at least I hope it, it's a bit higher uh, uh, in, the, in the next poll. Uh, but I think in, in all states, um, uh, we have a pretty good chance in, in making it into the parliament there. Um, we are not in the parliament in Saxony-Anhalt, 
in Thuringia and in Mecklenburg-Vorpommern, as Eric mentioned, we are not that that strong in the in the eastern part of, of, of Germany. Um, Berlin being the only um, uh, state legislator uh, where we are uh, uh, part of, um, and and I think in, in really in Berlin we have a really good chance in not only uh, um, making back into into the in, in the state legislator, but also um, we have the opportunity. Um, to, to enter a government there. And we haven't governed in, in Berlin for the past 30 years. Um, so it, it, it will be really an interesting year. Uh, and as we mentioned, we just had our, um, our uh, Bundesparteitag, our party convention, uh, and, and we have just been elected uh, a board member uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the FDP. And I think she's best to talk about uh, the Bundesparteitag. Yeah, just to give you a quick report, um... Um, it uh, was a dig digital party convention. Um, however, more than uh, 700, uh, uh, 700, sorry, 700 party members were present. And um, many of them, um, most of the time, even though we were discussing the uh, party platform for two days, uh, the elections were only on Friday um, for the national board. And on Saturday and Sunday, we spent, um, I think, yeah, 14, 15, 16 hours um, discussing the platform, which is um, not easy uh, when it's all digital, but it went very well um, from my point of view. And it showed that there are many um, members that really want to um, be involved in the, in the platform. We have uh, rising membership um, numbers. We are very close to be uh, more than um, 70 thousand uh, members in the FTP. So um, it was a good signal this, this weekend that so many were involved. Um, yeah, as uh, Eric mentioned, the, uh, the motto of the weekend was, um, as it is, it must not remain. And um, uh, there has never been more to do, um, which um, yeah focuses especially on what uh, are the um, yeah, missed opportunities of the past, uh, which we want to um, uh, uh, to work on in the in the next legislation period. Um, we have a, a new team, um, we have a new vice chair of the FTP who is a very progressive um, young man and um, a very um, yeah, many um, women uh, who are now a member of the board. So that is, um, I think, a very good sign for um, the FTP and um, so on the one hand, um, we have our uh, core policy competencies, um, which uh, we are still focusing on. So uh, very classic, like tax reduction, reducing bureaucracy, um, strong focus on civil rights, and um, you know, also digitalization, education, which has been um, very much discussed in Germany in the past um, month and um, still today not all the schools are opened um, due to the pandemics so there's a lot to do and um, the FTP is still focusing on these um, issues um, but um, they are um, also um, uh, there's also a strong focus on, on new um, key policy areas climate change has a, plays a big role um, in this platform uh, civil liberties I already mentioned foreign policy um, is one of uh, the, the key um, issues in this um, platform. And we have um, some other like new ideas. Uh, Eric mentioned already the liberal feminism, which is something very new um, in the platform. Um, we have uh, things like animal welfare and mental health care um, that um, play a role, not like the biggest role, but play a role in the, in the platform. And it shows that there's um, always progress and um, I think also um, shows that there is potential to um, attract um, new voters um, for the FTP in September. And Ria already mentioned um, foreign policy has always been an important issue uh, for, for the Free Democrats. So and, and essentially, obviously, and in, uh, in, a, in a discussion format where we, where we also talk about the implications of the election for the for the transatlantic relationship. So we thought to talk a bit uh, in more detail about what we have uh, discussed the past weekend um, and, and advocated also obviously uh, before um, uh, this uh, election uh, uh, program. Um, I think one of the core issues for us is renewing the transatlantic uh, partnership. Um, 
uh, one of the ideas um, that is, is there to our heart is, 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 is the uh, transatlantic economic area. So we know that it will be hard to get another TTIP done, but at least um, uh, something close to that um, and, and to coordinate more closely with the Biden administration on, uh, on, on, on trade issues, particularly with regard to the WTO reform. Um, then um, the FDP is, is committed uh, to the NATO. Um, um, I mean, all of you know probably um, that there has been a contested issue between uh, the US and Germany. Um, we actually propose to not only have a 2% goal, but to have the 3D goal. That means 3% uh, of the GDP uh, should be spent for defense development and diplo diplomacy to have like an integrated approach um, uh, to world, uh, global, uh, global issues. Um, uh, and then obviously uh, we also are interested in, 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 in this debate on, 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 on the EU level on uh, open strategic sovereignty or uh, as the EU put it uh, in their, in their uh, recent trade strategy, open um, um, strategic autonomy. For us, it's particularly important uh, to emphasize the open in that strategic sovereignty or strategic autonomy should never mean that we want to, um, uh, want to have autarky or uh, that we are engaged in, in, in protectionist policies. For us, it's always um, to have the capacities um, to take respons the responsibility and also to address the, the systemic competition with China uh, and the unfair trade practices of the PRC. Um, something that we have also discussed um, this past weekend is the cooperation uh, among liberal democracies. Um, uh, President ba Biden has, has proposed a summit of democracies. There's talk about the alliance, alliance of democracies. Um, at the G7 summit, we have talked about the about the D10. Um, so basically, renewing the G7 uh, and 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 make it a forum where large democracies can cooperate and address um, common issues, particularly with regard to systemic competition and the systemic threat coming from the People's Republic of China. Uh, and then, obviously, for for a liberal party, something that's also dear to our heart is, is the ambitious trade agenda. And uh, the reform of the WTO, and I think we can we can uh, talk about that later in the Q and A if you're interested. Um, and then, obviously, an, an interesting uh, topic is also um, to talk about the the coalitions uh, that that might um, form uh, after the election. Um, the FDP is currently involved in three coalitions on state level. We have a Jamaica coalition, the, the CDU, the FDP. Uh, and the Greens in uh, Schleswig-Holstein. Um, then we have the so-called traffic light coalition or ample coalition. Um, it's always de depends on the on the party colors. So this would be the the red SPD, uh, the Greens, and 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 the FDP uh, that has been just renewed in in, in Rhineland uh, Palatinate. Um, and then we have uh, the more traditional FDP coalition that is the CDU FDP coalition. In, in North Rhine-Westphalia, and actually after the election in Baden-Württemberg, we talked, um, we entered coalition talks um, uh, with the SPD and, and, and the Greens um, about a, a, a traffic light coalition in Baden-Württemberg, but eventually the Greens opted for a green uh, CDU coalition. Um, so as you see, um, um, the FDP wants to govern um, and, it's, and it's quite open. To partner with CDU, SPD, and or Greens in various coalitions. There is again the Jamaica coalition, the Traffic Light coalition, the CDU FDP coalition is, uh, if you if you ever look at the numbers, uh, unlikely. Um, uh, and there is also the option uh, of a of a Deutschland coalition, a German coalition, uh, made up of CDU, SPD, uh, and the FDP. But it's also more, uh, it, it, it's unlikely that, that that's going to happen uh, in September. But so it's it's it's. It's a really interesting uh, election year. I mean, it 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 it, it will it, it will um, open the post Merkel area in German politics. Um, and if you look at the at the polls of the other parties, it's open. Um, what it's gonna gonna happen? A lot will depend on the key policy areas that are addressed uh, during the campaign. Um, right now, um, we talk a, a lot about the 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 uh, COVID nineteen measures, about the uh, vaccination campaign. Um, but I think 
the closer we move to the election, the more people are vaccinated, um, then we will more talk about the about the economy uh, and and how actually we restart the economy um, in Germany. And that is obviously something where the FDP uh, has a lot to offer. Um, and I think it will also matter uh, 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 how the other parties um, are shaped. Um, I mean, I think Ria can can and can talk more about that um, uh, because I mean we have we have a competition. The FDP um, has at least shown that we are we much united behind behind our, our chairman Christian Lindner. But Ria, you are better suited than me to talk about that. We can uh, both discuss that, I think, and uh, I think many uh, of the participants that uh, attended the other meetings might also have an idea about that, but I will um, just give uh, some some more ideas to that, especially um, when we uh, focus on the other um, like democratic parties, um, the, uh, which uh, for me is uh, um, besides the FDP, the SPD, the CDU, uh, CSU, and the Greens, um, the the SPD is very irrelevant right now. Is my feeling they are um, uh, quite united, more or less, but um, they uh, still have a uh, have had a big fight about their direction because the party leaders they're very left, and um, their leading candidate um, is more of the of the right um, uh, in terms of the SPD. Um, so it's it's very unclear what people will get when they vote for the SPD, and um, so the the media focus is not so much on them because they are just yeah not not that relevant uh, to most people. Um, uh, the focus is more on the Greens and the CDU, of course, uh, the Greens because they are in in such a good shape. Um, they have just um, uh, announced their uh, leading candidate. Uh, which is Annalena Baerbock, um, a young woman, um, which is yeah very interesting for for many people, um, and um, they seem very united at the moment. Um, however, they will um, have their argues um, in um, when it comes to the question in which direction they will go for the coalitions, um, because on the one hand um, they have the option to um, form coalition with the conservatives, um, which for some in the party um, uh, is, is, is not so nice. And on the other hand, um, there's still on the table um, the option to, um, to form a coalition um, uh, with the SPD and the left party, uh, which would be the only coalition um, um, including the, the left party because uh, neither the CDU, CSU uh, nor the FDP um, is uh, ready to form a coalition with the left. Um, uh, so um, uh, those are very <laughs> different options and the party has not decided yet in which direction they will go and it's open if they will decide before um, the elections or if they are able um, to not answer the question until then. Um, the CDU, uh, however, does not have a platform yet and um, it's not clear when they will um, provide their, their, their party platform. Um, they. Um, had big struggles in the, in the party um, because first in uh, um, uh, in the beginning of 2021 they elected a new party leader after a few weeks um, they had new uh, argue about um, if that leader I mean Laschet um, is going to be the chancellor candidate or not um, because um, and, and uh, Markus Söder uh, from the CSU uh, was um, also in the race, so they are not <laughs> very united at the moment. Um, they have a lot of um, argues inside the party. They're not very clear in which direction they want to go. And um, you can also see that um, on the polls. Um, so that is very open and it um, also um, uh, determines in which direction the FDP will go. At the moment, it looks like um, the FDP will be needed for a few coalition options. Um, so that makes us more relevant, that makes it more interesting to see um, what is on our party platform, what are the questions that we are discussing. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's an important factor for us. Um, however, the, uh, the campaign season has not started yet. And um, I'm pretty sure that uh, this will um, bring uh, yeah, a lot of um, 
yeah, uh, new topics on uh, on the table. Uh, we will have to see how it goes with the um, pandemic. As Sven mentioned, um, climate change will play a big role in um, in the campaign uh, this year. The economic uh, development uh, will play a big role, and um, so um, yeah, there are many open questions uh, regarding the year. But it's uh, I think it's very. Um, interesting and I'm very eager um, to to go uh, into campaigning um, very soon and now I'm very eager to go into your questions and thank you so much for your attention. All right, thanks to both of you, uh, you know, really, really insightful comments. Uh, so I would ask all of our attendees to please type your questions into the Q&A box at the very bottom of the Zoom. I see that we have some questions in there already. So I will jump right in um, and read them off to our two speakers. So here's a question with regard to immigration and skilled labor needs. Um, do you have any thoughts on how the FTP is addressing uh, this uh, that will also gain some consensus amongst voters? Uh, you want to start or should I? Okay, um, so um, actually, um, and uh, Sven might have some numbers for that, we found out in, uh, in earlier um, polls that we made or statistics that uh, this is not a big topic for our voters. It, it does not decide uh, the elections for us. Um, however, um, for example, in North Rhine-Westphalia, um, we have uh, the Minister for Integration, so it is a, is a topic for us and the FDP has its own um, 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 like, uh, like a system uh, on how to deal with immigration or illegal immigration, but um, to welcome immigrants uh, that want to work um, in a um, like a skilled labor um, way in Germany, so, so it's, it's it's both. It's on the one hand welcoming for people that want to um, to immigrate to Germany um, for um, the economic development, but on the other hand, uh, it's very um, um, yeah closing down the options of um, yeah uh, coming to to Germany to um, not to work, and um, so that's a very unique position. Um, because the the left wings uh, they are like more opening to everyone to come and the right wings they don't want anyone to come so it's more or less in the middle but it seems that it's not um such a big topic this year especially and it is not a big topic for our voters in general but i mean the the, the issue of, of 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 skilled labor uh, immigration is obviously quite important for germany um, in, in terms of, of, of looking at the, at the demogra demographic development in, in Germany. And, and as, as, as Ria mentioned, the idea of, of Germany is basically to implement a migration system similar to that uh, of Canada. Um, so where we can actually look at, um, basically we have the three Ds in foreign policy and we have the four doors in, in in, in our immigration policy. So uh, we are advocating for an immigration law uh, that has four doors. The first one, obviously for asylum seekers. Um, so, so refugees that are, um, that are in need of, of, of protection. Uh, then we have um, a second door for, for those that, that flee um, uh, in, that came from war-turned countries like Syria. Um, it's the, the so-called subsidiera schutz, um, uh, which which basically allows only um, to to come to the country for a certain amount of time, as long as the conflict in the country goes on. And then we have the third door, and that one is for skilled labor. Um, uh, and then the fourth door is the one for for those people that 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 that, that don't match these criteria, uh, and that unfortunately have to to leave the country. So it's basically. As, as Ria mentioned, the combination of openness uh, on the one hand, but 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 a clear rule-based system as we see in Canada. All right, so we have lots of questions that have come in. So I'm going to skip some, maybe come back to them. Um, here's a great question from Mark Castle about how in the U.S. some of the largest firms like Amazon paid no corporate taxes despite record profits. Um, we also know that German corporations have avoided taxation through loopholes and tax havens. So where does the FTP stand? 
on efforts to make corporations pay their fair share. Mm. So um, I think um, like FTP um, is, is pro fair share of, um, um, of uh, um, uh, corporations. Um, as we we do not want uh, tax increases uh, increases for uh, corporations, but on the other hand, we are also party for the rule of law. So if there is a law and a tax law is law, um, it means that everybody uh, has to pay, uh, pay a fair share, and um, there is no um, tolerance for uh, corporations uh, uh, trying to avoid uh, their taxes because they are using the infrastructure. They are um, taking responsibility for their workers and so um, it's important also to um, demand that fair share um, and um, when it comes to for example the taxation of um, uh, not only um, US uh, corporations like Amazon, Facebook, um, Uber but also IKEA for example um, uh, we want uh, global standards for taxation um, which means that uh, there's no um, uh, yeah, avoidance of taxation um, also in Germany because everybody has to pay um, uh, a fair share because we have a lot, a uh, lot to do after, especially after the pandemic, uh, to get um, the economy back to work. But also, um, for example, in uh, digital, uh, yeah, like in the digitalization of the schools, for example. Um, so there's a lot to, to do, and um, the the state needs some of the money. And um, uh, the corporations, um, yeah, need to be involved in that. And now a question from uh, Louise Davidson Schmich: What does the FTP mean by liberal feminism? Are the new members joining gender balanced, or are they mainly men? Um, and is the party using a quota to select candidates or governing board members? Yeah. So I, I start with the, um, uh, uh, the the last question or the last two questions. The new members joining still are more men than women. Um, we are working on um, campaigns, especially for women, to uh, welcome them uh, in the FTP. But uh, we still uh, have in our membership um, a higher number, much higher number of men than women. So it's still a case uh, uh, for us. Um, and um, we do not have a quota um, in, in the party for the, the election of the board, but we have an increasing um, network of uh, female politicians within the FTP, um, which is strongly working on um, yeah, leading the path of uh, more women to the national board, but also in the on the state level, and also when it comes to the, um, to the elections um, on the um, federal state lists. So um, there's uh, a lot of things that are being done, um, but we do not have a quota. Um, what we have is like a, yeah, like a, like an aim that the um, on state level um, is formed by the um, by the local branches, um, but it's not, um, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's not a strong quota. It's more like uh, an aim that they give themselves, and afterwards it's uh, like evaluated if it's if it's done and. Yeah, liberalism, uh, liberal feminism, um, is um, yeah, especially or more or less the idea um, just that that men and women are um, of the same value and that they have, should have the same chances and that we um, have to form um, not only um, a society but also um, an economy where men and women have the same chances and that we want to support. Um, women also um, in an economic uh, way um, to to go um, yeah build their own dreams and um, get uh, go the way uh, they want to go. Sven, any, any other uh, or implications additions? Okay. No, I mean it's it's like what liberals always want to have equal opportunities for uh, for men and women, and I think that's not the case currently. All right, here's a question from Jonathan Olson. Uh, can you tell us how, in terms of policy profile, the FDP is distinguishing itself from the CDU on the one hand and from the Greens on the other? Uh, what issues do you think will attract voters who might be deciding between supporting you and either the CDU, CSU, or the Greens? Yeah, I think um, uh, I think what what the what the FDP brings to the table is that we com combine 
economic liberalism or, and civil liberties. Uh, and I think that has none all them. I mean, the CDU is obviously conservative parties. Um, talking about LGBTI rights or anything, they are they're still pretty conservative talking about immigration. They they still tend to deny that we are an immigration country, which we are. Um, uh, they are they are still a bit economic liberal, but they actually have have moved to the left on on, this, on these issues. And and so I think that is basically we are a liberal party in an economic and in, 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 in a civil liberty sense. And and this also distinguishes us from from the Greens. I think that the competition between the Greens and the and the FDP is quite interesting. Um, uh, because the um, the Greens, at least they appear currently uh, as the more centrist parties. But uh, I mean, I just read an article in 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 Der Spiegel, a German a German magazine, um, where were they talking about the the election program of the Greens? Um, that many members are not quite um, satisfied by what Annalena Baerbock and, and Robert Habeck are proposing because they want the the party to move toward the left. And so right now the people don't, don't, don't really know what they get when they vote uh, for the Greens. I think where we are very much aligned is uh, in some parts of foreign policy. I think both the FDP and the Greens uh, want to protect the, the liberal international order. Um, that is, and, and address the, the, the challenge by China and, and Russia. But the interesting thing is that if you vote for the Greens, you might end up in a coalition with the left and the SBD. And they, particularly the left have, has definitely has a different view on 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 these countries. So it's 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 really interesting. But obviously, we are more uh, liberal in an economic sense than than the Greens. Ria, any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, I think um, Sven Sven is absolutely right, and um, I think. Um, especially the Green Party is uh, very different from, from state level to state level. For example, in um, Baden-Württemberg, um, as we mentioned earlier, um, instead of uh, forming a coalition with uh, SPD and FDP, uh, like traffic light coalition, they decided for the CDU. Um, so they are more conservative um, um, party branches on the state level. Um, but for example, in Berlin, uh, they are governing with uh, the left wing party and the SPD. Um, so they, they are not quite clear in which direction they want to go. And especially when it comes to economic issues, um, they are, um, um, yeah, pro-state and um, um, pro-taxation, for example, and they see the um, the um, they they see more uh, importance in uh, what the state does than in what people do, and I think that's a big difference. And we have to figure out in uh, which um, policies that makes a difference. Uh, for example, when it comes to climate change, are we uh, we are the ones who are trusting more in people. Um, we want to give um, a, um, um, a regulatory um, policy um, and then give it to companies and people um, to form the ideas um, uh, for the, uh, to, to, come, uh, to go the way um, with uh, the, the climate change. And uh, so we have very different ideas on that. And um, I hope that, uh, that we will find a way if it comes uh, to that situation um, uh, to um, go to that common goal, which is uh, to, um, yeah, have a climate neutral uh, future um, and uh, do not, uh, yeah, uh, collide on the way on how to get there. So I think that... if, if I if I just may may, may jump, jump on that, because this is basically the biggest difference, and there's a, a beautiful book about that, between the FDP and the Greens, uh, that that the FDP have trust in the individual. So, in in, in as as Ria mentioned, in terms of, of 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 climate change mitigation, we say okay, we give you uh, we do cap and trade. So we give a limit and the goal that we want to achieve, and then you can basically through a, a finder guys, uh, as as you mentioned, Eric, um, can basically find a way toward that. And, and, and the Greens, they have a different view how, 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 how humans interact, which is more to give them guidance um, uh, and, and, and people need help uh, to live their life. And, and that is probably the biggest difference between the two parties.
All right. I mean, th that kind of sets up uh, one of the biggest questions that uh, uh, is out there uh, that Mark Hassel kind of um, uh, noted, as well as um, several other uh, questioners. And that is that the last couple of years have kind of rehabilitated the state in a lot of people's minds, right? That um, it was really the state that helped us get through the pandemic. We're not there yet. There have been some hiccups along the way. But um, certainly, I think most voters in Germany and elsewhere, especially the United States these days, understand how a well-functioning state is, is necessary. Um, if you think about green jobs, if you think about this transition uh, to the, the, the next phase of economic uh, activity, uh, the state has played quite a role in the Energiewende, for instance, in Germany, and will likely continue to do so in the future. So um, how, how do you think that this kind of libertarian message the, the, the message of trying to empower individuals to kind of do the right thing. Um, do you think that that is, you know, appropriate for where Germany is headed? Um, and do you think that that message is going to resonate with voters? So I, I do not think that it's enough to say, okay, I hope that people will um, just use less carbon uh, to to, to go to a climate neutral future. I don't believe that. And that's not the idea that um, the Liberal Party has. It, it's more that we think that we need a regulatory uh, measurement, um, uh, like, uh, um, yeah, like the, the we, we call that a CO2 limit um, or like a, a carbon limit that we can, um, uh, so that we can reduce uh, the number of uh, CO2 that is emitted every year, and this goes down every year. So um, uh, in, in 2019, we emitted uh, uh, 51 billion tons of CO2, I think, if I have the numbers right, and the uh, German-English um, billion million thing. Um, so um, next year uh, it must be less and the year after it must be less and so uh, Germany has its share on that and the other industry states have their share on that and this must sink every year and so we give a CO2 limit for that and um, but we do not um, say we know the way how to reduce uh, the carbon. Um, we um, put a price tag um, which is um, by the um, cap and trade um, uh, and an and, um, ETS, emission trading system. Um, so we have a, a, a market system that puts the price tag, not the state, because I think it, we are not able um, to see how the development will go. Um, but then we also put a lot of in, investment into um, research on, and development on uh, the way that we go to that climate neutral future um, when it comes to producing, when it comes to mobility, when it comes to heating and cooling, um, we have a lot to do and we uh, just do not want the way to just um, uh, tell people um, that, um, that they uh, need to cut short on things, but we want um, climate neutral alternatives, for example, to um, to flying. Um, we do not want people not to go on holidays in the future, we just want to make a flying climate neutral and that is um, the, a, a different way and I think that um, is the better way because it cuts emissions um, definitely the CO2 limit um, does not uh, give any alternatives of cutting CO2 it makes it just very expensive if you do not um, reach the goals that you set for for the past year and um, on the other hand um, it, um, it is very effective in um, pushing forward innovations and these innovations will not only make Germany um, climate neutral, uh, carbon neutral, but it will um, uh, give innovations that, and technologies that can also help, especially in developing countries, um, for them to get climate neutral, especially when they start going on holidays, because many um, today uh, I can't go on holidays because they are not in a way um, that makes it possible, but they will go there. And I think it's a good development um, when, when people have these chances, but then we should be ready um, with climate neutral technologies uh, to make it uh, possible in a cl climate neutral way. So we're rapidly running out of time. I think we have time for one more question and we have a couple of foreign policy questions. So I'll try to um, uh, uh, bundle them together. Um, and I think that uh, essentially the question is, what would be distinctive 
about an FDP foreign policy, especially when it comes to um, certain challenges like Russia um, and China? Well, um, I mean, first of all, I think the German foreign policy for most of its history was the party were very much aligned. Um, the parties um, on the on the on the uh, on the left, like the, the the left, so the left on the far left side and on the far right side, they were out of a of a of a post war consensus about about German foreign policy. But now we see actually um, uh, that the SPD. Um, is quite soft on China and and, and Russia. Um, the foreign minister uh, was always late to address human rights issues. Um, they are still in favor of of North Stream two, um, and we have the CDU that is some somewhere in between. They are still uh, uh, in favor of of of, of North Stream two, and and what we see is basically that the most distinctive part that would that the FDP brings to the table is that um, we have a clear focus on protecting the liberal international order in terms of trade, in terms of security. We, are, we, we don't discuss um, equidistance between China and the US. We are clearly on the side of the United States. Um, they are our closest ally. Um, we are focusing on, 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 on European integration, but always in, <laughs> In alliance with with the U.S., um, we are in favor of, of of more strategic sovereignty, but always open sovereignty in the EU, and particularly when it comes to trade policy, we are obviously a free 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 trade party. Um, and I, I think I think what I mean, as I mentioned, I think that the Greens and the FDP they are aligned on on on, on protecting the liberal international order. Um, but what that means, I think there are there are some differences, and I think that that the, the German government or the next coalition government would benefit from the FDP um, because it, it, it would basically um, stick to the, to the course um, of, 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 of making, making transatlantic relations a priority. And there's also, I mean, this also goes for, for taxation policy. We have mentioned uh, the issue of, um, um, of, 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 of taxing uh, uh, digital companies. And what we always, we always said that we can't, do it unilaterally because otherwise we would risk a trade conflict with the US. We always said we need a solution on, on OECD level, like the one proposed by, by Janet Yellen on the global minimum tax. And I think that is that is something that is, I mean, I wouldn't say distinctive, but that is something that we bring to the table. We have some final thoughts. Sven mentioned uh, the most important things. I think for, for us as a uh, the, the party of Hans Dietrich Genscher, um, uh, the European Union and um, to, to strengthen the, the European Union is always very important, but we also see um, a, a strong European Union um, uh, having more responsibility in the world, especially when it comes to the protection of um, freedom and human rights globally. Those are our leading thoughts in, in the international politics. We want to have uh, stronger partners uh, when it comes to, to human rights. Uh, Transatlantic partnership is very important for us um, as we see that as a part of, uh, of the solution and forming a better world and better chances for more people uh, globally. And um, um, uh, especially when it comes to conflicts like in, in Belarus, in in, uh, in Hong Kong, um, also um, now when it comes to Israel, um, we have a very strong, um, uh, strong position, and um, I think that will continue um, also when uh, we will be part of the next government. All right, thank you so much. We have um, come to time, uh, so thank you so much for taking uh, some time out of your very busy schedule, coming right off of the Patai Tag to speak with us today. It's greatly appreciated. Thanks to all the attendees who have Zoomed in. Um, I would also like to give a shout out to our next event in the series, which will be on uh, Tuesday, June 1st, where we tackle um, foreign policy um, and the bonus tag election. I'm pleased to announce that we have some confirmed speakers, including Bob Zellick um, and Angela Stent, and then hopefully former ambassador, um, Peter Wittig. Uh, so please uh, check your email for uh, those invitations. 
and we, we hope to see you again soon here at AICGS. Thank you, everybody.